Hello, why do you decide to give me attention when I'm starting to get busy? I'm trying to do things and you just want to love on me now? What? Why? Don't leave me. I mean, I'm complaining, but I still love you. Okay, I've been left. Sad. I'm babysitting cats, so if you hear bells jingling or rapid running across the room, that's what that is. But yeah, so if you hear a bunch of noise, you can probably guess that it's them. So, today's video is going to be about the DuPont de Lagones family. I find it really interesting. I believe there was a documentary done on Netflix about them, possibly either Netflix or Hulu. Um, but I was uh, doing some research on different video ideas I could do, and I was looking into unsolved murders. It's interesting. Let's just say that. So, here we go. It is estimated that sometime in early April in 2011, tragedy struck at 55 Boulevard Robert Schumann when the entire DuPont de Lagones family was murdered, aside from Javier, the patriarch of the family, who had disappeared and was nowhere to be found. <laughs> Javier Pierre Marie DuPont de Lagones was born January 9, 1961 in Versailles, France. His father was Bernard Hubert Dupont de Lagones, and his mother was Genevieve Therese Metra. When asked about their childhood, his sister Christine said, We were brought up in the Catholic faith, but it was far from being a fundamentalist atmosphere. She also said that their mother claimed for years to receive messages from God gathered in a collection she titled Messages of Love and Mercy. When Javier was 10 and his sister was 14, their father deserted the family home, leaving the children alone with their mother, Genevieve. Just after the tragedy, she was singled out on suspicion of having founded a sectarian group. The mother pushed the children into a form of mystical schizophrenia between evil and good, sin and redemption, that permeated them deeply, says actor Bruno de Stabenrath, a family friend who knew Javier in middle school. In 1980, Javier met Agnes Hodanger, although they didn't decide to settle down until Javier left and upon returning in either 1989 or 1990, found out Agnes was pregnant with a child of another man and decided to marry her despite the social norms of the time raising the child, Arthur, who was two, as his own. Together, Agnes and Javier had three other children named Thomas, born in 1992, and born in 1994, and the youngest, Benoit, born in 1997. Although Agnes and Javier seemed to be the perfect family, living a luxurious life, there were problems within the marriage on the rise since as early as 2002 that would come to a head in the coming years before the murders. Agnes, seven years before the murder in 2004, wrote on an online medical forum called Dactissimo. Agnes wrote about the difficulties her and Javier had been facing and said this, Javier is too judgmental, too quick to argue, too rigid, too military. There is no more tenderness between us, no more attention, no softness, no sex. When I ask him if he's happy, his response is always the same. Yes, I am, but if we could all die tomorrow, that would be better. In 2005, the marital problems worsened when Agnes filed a police report against Javier for assaulting their oldest son, who was 15 at the time. The Dupont de Lagones family ran into financial problems, and to keep them afloat, Javier created several unsuccessful business fronts, using mostly the money inherited from Agnes's family. One business, based in Pornic, called Cellref, was among these failed businesses. The company's 2006 accounts only show the bare minimum of information, and the last information pertaining to the company was filed with the French Register of Commerce, February 24, 2004. As manager of Cellref, Javier hired six salespeople in 2003 and fired them all shortly after. In 2011, their financial problems got even worse when the inheritance money from Agnes began to run out and they were plunged into debt. Javier, driven to his wit's end by the stress he was in, took up a mistress in Paris, paying her a large sum of 50,000 euros. 
In 2010, he emailed her saying, I am ruined. I'm at rock bottom like never before. I am awake almost every night with these morbid ideas, burning down the house after giving everyone sleeping pills or killing myself so that Agnes gets $600,000. In any case, my life will end in the next few months if I don't get 25,000 euros immediately. Most of the time, I am not in a dream but in a nightmare, and I can't escape except, of course, by doing something radical and final. In the months leading up to the family's brutal murder, Javier made several suspicious purchases and many of the family's accounts began to close and their social ties began to be severed. On February 2nd, 2011, Javier obtained his firearms license. A month later, March 12th, Javier purchased rifle bullets. March 26th, he registered for and visited a shooting range in North Nantes and visited it four times, the last one taking place on April 1st. It should be noted that Thomas and Benoit were also beginning to learn how to shoot while Arthur was scheduled to begin soon after. I find this really interesting because so far, Xavier has made himself out to be quite suspicious. He's not even seeming to try to hide his plans from his family or anyone important who could possibly give him away or, you know, let somebody know what he's doing. I, I just think it's really odd that, you know, one minute he's being very open about his plans and then the next he seems like he's trying to cover his tracks. And why would you teach the sons that you are supposedly going to kill how to shoot? It, it just, it's odd. It doesn't make sense to me. A sales receipt from a DIY store dated either March 23rd or 30th listed several purchases, including a roll of large trash bags and plastic pavers, which are used to fill with gravel or grass and line large areas such as a sidewalk or driveway. On April 1st, Arthur left the college where he was studying but never arrived at the pizzeria where he worked. He was supposed to be picking up his monthly pay that day, which his boss said surprised him when he did not show up because he was always on time to pick up his wages. At the same time, Javier purchased cement and a hoe. On April 2nd, Javier purchased four 22-pound bags of lime, each from different shops within the Nantes area. On Sunday, April 3rd, the DuPont's neighbor, Fabrice, saw Agnes from the last time and a few hours later, allegedly saw Javier putting large bags into his car. He also stated that a few days after that, he heard the two Labradors owned by the family screaming to death and then silence. At 10.37 p.m., Javier left a voicemail for his sister Christine stating, We spent our Sunday evening in the cinema. <laughs> we spent our Sunday evening in the cinema together, then in a restaurant, and we've just got back. I'm just calling to ask if it's too late to speak to you on the phone, and now I see that it's gone to voicemail. But I was surprised. You spoke to me about Bertram, who's getting ready for his flight, huh? But I thought he'd only just arrived, so I was a bit surprised. Anyway, sending you my love. If it's not too late, call me back, or send me a text, and I'll call you. Okay, I'm going to put the kids to bed. Say hi to everyone. See you soon. Maybe. So fucking creepy. Maybe. Or will I? I'm sorry. Monday, April 4th, neither Anne nor Benoit showed up at their school. Their friends were concerned because they remembered they had heard rumors about their family moving to Australia and found it strange that they had not mentioned anything. But the director of the school, Oliver, and I really hope I don't butcher this, but so? Boisson. Boisson. Do you want a croissant? I'm sorry. I apologize. Oliver B. <laughs> Olivier. I, I called him Oliver. That's me. That's my name. He's not me. Olivier B. <clears throat> This is not going to turn into the other day. I'm not going to have as much difficulty as I did the other day trying to get this done. Let me take a sip of my drink and try to see if that helps. Don't worry, little kitty. I'm just taking a sip of my drink. Just go back to sleep.
Enjoy your slumber. All the cats are napping. I wish I was napping. Back to the story. But the director of the school, Olivier B, informed them they were both out sick. Had to go through that real slowly. Make sure I got it. These French names are really difficult. I don't mean to butcher them, and I did look up a lot of the pronunciations for these, but they're, they're still really difficult. I'm not French, unfortunately. I am a Mississippian, born and raised, and not proud of it. They tried contacting the pair by text and email, but were unable to reach them. Later that day, Javier spoke to his sister over the phone for approximately 40 minutes, and according to her, he seemed quite normal. She said he was even joking around and quite the brother I remembered him to be. Around 9 p.m., Javier and Thomas went alone to a high restaurant called La Croix Cadeau in Arville. Oh, these names are a doozy. <laughs> Javier ordered a 35 euro tasting menu with a half bottle of Anjou Village's Brissac red wine. Thomas had a sea bass dish and a tomato juice. Don't know why I had to pause for that. Tomato, such a difficult word. Oh, potato, tomato, potato, tomato. The total bill for the meal came to 72.55 euros. Two waiters who served them named Sophie and Cedric remember Thomas feeling unwell near the end of the meal and stated, We just noticed that they were both very quiet. They hardly said anything to each other during the meal and that they were very courteous and kind. Investigators speculated that Javier Dupont de Lagones murdered his wife and three of his children on the night of April 3rd or 4th and murdered his son Thomas on the evening of April 5th. On the morning of April 5th, a bailiff came to the res residence to collect a debt of $20,000, but no one answered the door. Neighbors claimed that Agnes was still alive at the time as they saw her outside her house that afternoon and again two days later. An employee of a hairdressing salon near the house claimed on RTL to have seen Agnes on April 5th, too. She says, I came to pick up my wages. It was a Tuesday. I saw her on the sidewalk on her phone around 12.15 or 12.30. The prosecutor in Nantes acknowledged that the forensic experts were unable to narrow down the date of death down to a specific day. Thomas spent Tuesday afternoon with a friend for music class at his home in Angers, where they paid mu- Thomas spent Tuesday afternoon with a friend for music class at his home- uh, uh called Bondulins. I'm having a strong. Thomas spent Tuesday afternoon with a friend from music class at his home in Angers, where they played music and watched television. Thomas had planned to spend the night at his friend's house, but Javier phoned his son asking him to return to Nantes as his mother had been involved in a cycling accident. Thomas ate quickly with his friend then took a train home at around 10 p.m. The following day, the friend tried to reach Thomas, but only received brief text messages in reply, such as, I'm not coming to yours, I'm ill, and really ill, I'm not coming to class. Two days later, his friend received a text, I'm out of battery, my dad's looking for a new charger for me. This was the last time anyone heard from Thomas. I personally believe Javier, or whoever killed the family at the time, was actually texting in place for Thomas because it was said that the friend didn't believe that it sounded like Thomas's own writing, and it, it just, it just, it seems too sus to me to have been him. April 6th, Arthur's girlfriend knocked and even saw a light on on the first floor, but no one answered, and she also noted the two dogs didn't bark like normal. April 7th, Javier was seen making several trips back and forth to his car, and loading it up with large bags by a neighbor. The same neighbor said the newspapers say the autopsies put her death on 4th of April, but I'm almost convinced I saw her on the evening of Thursday the 7th because I know I didn't have much time to speak to her as I pick up my son from the childminder every Thursday evening. 
more than two years later and she was still convinced that she saw her on the 7th as reported by Anne sophie martin who appeared on special correspondent a new segment broadcasted on the channel france 2. april 8th javier sent an email to his brother-in-law stating everything's fine bertram you'll hear more detailed news soon through christine bye for now all the best javier this was the last time the IP address from the home was used. On April 11th, Anne and Benoit's school received a letter signed by Javier stating that Anne and Benoit would be leaving the school and the family would be moving back to Australia due to urgent professional changes. The Catholic school where Agnes worked received a resignation letter signed by Agnes stating the same reason for leaving. The headmaster is unable to reach her by telephone. A typed unsigned letter dated April 11th, which is speculated to have been added afterwards, was sent to Javier's immediate family. Javier explained in the letter that after working undercover for the DEA, the entire family had to relocate to the United States as part of a federal witness protection program, and that no one would be able to contact them for a few years. He advised his relatives to circulate reports on social media that the family has in fact moved to Australia. It's unknown if Javier's DNA was ever found on the letter, so there's no way to know if it was him who wrote the letter, although it's highly likely. Javier spent two nights at the hotel premiere Classe Blagnac. Blagnac? Blagnac? Not sure. Baloney. In Baloney! in southern France under the alias Laurent Javier and paid for his stay by credit card. On the 13th, neighbors of the family called the police after noticing the house had been seemingly empty for a week, while Agnes's car remained out front the entire time. On the same day, Javier spent the night at a hotel in Var. He had lived in the town in the 1980s. He reached out to a former girlfriend from the time, but they did not meet. The last known sighting of Javier was on the 14th. He withdrew 30 euros from an ATM in Roqueburn, Sir Argens, and Var. He then checked into a hotel called Formula One and was captured on surveillance. And I, I'm not sure if I'm going to do it yet because of the video that I'm using, but I may or may not um, add a picture of him being captured on surveillance. In this area where I'm talking about. The following morning, he checked out, abandoning his car there. On April 21st, the remains of the family and their two dogs were found under the back patio near the garden. According to the autopsies, the victims were drugged and then shot dead with a 22-inch rifle as they slept. Javier inherited a gun from his father three weeks before matching the description of the murder weapon used. An arrest warrant was issued on the 29th, but Javier has not been found since. So that's it. That's where our story leaves off. I know it's not a satisfying ending, but to make up for that, I have some really interesting theories at the end, and I'll tell you my favorite one that I think is most plausible. The first and least interesting is the theory given by the authorities themselves. They believe that Javier disappeared into the mountains to kill himself, although there is no evidence to support this. And I personally feel like it doesn't make sense because I think Javier went through way too much effort to disappear after his family was murdered. If he wanted to kill himself, why wouldn't he have done it at the house where the rest of the family died? So even though this is the most official, I choose not to believe it because I just feel like it doesn't make sense. I don't know. Tell me what you guys think. The second one comes from Reddit. It states that Dupont de Lagones had an accomplice who helped him kill his family. Given his bad back and the location of the bodies, they say that he couldn't have disposed of five bodies by himself. Somebody helped him coordinate those murders and helped him get away. Another suggested his wife was actually his accomplice. The third one comes directly from Javier's family. They say the Dupont de Lagones family is in hiding and his letter about being an informant for the DEA may not be fake after all. Some of their supporting evidence, which I've been unable to verify, is that after Javier was supposedly gone, things in the house such as cleaning supplies and a tablecloth had seemingly moved, and the fact that the autopsy seemed rushed. 
They claimed that the autopsy was written on site, and when they described the bodies, the details were inconsistent, such as saying Agnes's hair was brunette when it was really white. Again, I find this one pretty unplausible because people have looked into it and they say that the DEA normally doesn't fake deaths like that. Um, and I feel like if it was for the witness protection program, you know, because he can't be found, they wouldn't make such a spectacle of making him disappear. I don't really think this one makes much sense, but I understand why the family would have come up with this theory because, you know, it's someone they love and they care about and they don't want to think about them being a murderer. So, while I understand it, I don't think it's true. The fourth and final theory is the one that I find most plausible. The theory states that Javier was able to get away and went into hiding under an alias and died using that name, meaning he will most likely never be found. And to finish this off, I also want to add an interesting little tidbit of information. There have been over 900 reported sightings over the following decade and someone signing as Dupont de Lagones sent to Nantes journalists a picture of Dupont de Lagones' sons, Arthur and Benoit, and in the back, there was a handwritten note that read, I am still alive, in 2015. Okay, so that is the end of this video. I hope you really enjoyed it. I found it really interesting. Um, I really enjoyed researching it. I really enjoyed reading about it, and I really enjoyed making the video in general. Um, if you did like it, I would really appreciate it if you gave me a thumbs up, subscribed, and turn on the notifications because I plan on being here for a while.